this is a whole new level of survival, and we're trying to film it. I commend anyone who can survive in this area. There's a bear right across. I feel like I'm starving. I didn't come here to get killed. It's gonna be hell. Hey, Bear! What was that? <laughs> At History, what we like to do is find a way to do a show in a category that just really feels different. No question about it, I am definitely crazy. It's not going to be the pristine reality show that you've seen on some of the other networks. It's gonna feel a little bit grittier, a little bit more raw. We have to film it, and there is no crew. Whoa, 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 whoa. We're driving in the opposite direction of what you normally do in a survival situation. We're elongating the process instead of trying to get out of it. It's a simple thing. Whoever can stay out the longest wins. Pretty sure I just saw a cougar. Vancouver Island has the highest population of cougar in North America. They have over 7,000 black bear and hundreds of wolves. I'm sitting in here. I was just charged by a bear. I don't know where he is. He could be into the woods circling behind me. I don't know. One of the biggest mental challenges they had was starting fire. And everything in this forest is soaking wet. 12.5 feet of rainfall every year. These guys are basically in a car wash on a daily basis. This has been so much tougher than I thought it would be. These guys were out there for weeks and weeks and weeks on end with no interaction with anyone else. Surviving is one thing. Isolation is something completely different. I don't have a camera crew. I don't have a, a naked park <laughs> here to talk to. And I don't have any interaction whatsoever except for me and this camera. And it's freaking me out. You wonder if the people in your life really know how much you love them. Isolation certainly took a toll and took people out of this competition. Alone is more authentic than any other survival program out there. There are no gimmicks. It's just men and their cameras and their will to survive. You really cannot prepare yourself for being in a situation like this. When you're alone, it's go time. So let the fun begin. These guys are, are going all the way back. They're going back to the very beginning where there are no resources. There is none of that. They have to create everything for themselves. I think that's what really connects it to history. Um, that I watched uh, this past year called Alone, and I was curious. I saw a, a promo for it somewhere, and I thought, ooh, that looks like a cool show. So I, I streamed it and watched it and enjoyed it. And as I was watching this show, my, my preaching filter kicked in, right? Every pastor has a preaching filter that we literally cannot turn off, okay? You need to know this. Every conversation I ever have, every uh, show or movie I ever watch, every song I hear on the radio— uh, somehow a little thing turns on in my brain and I go, ooh, that'll preach, right? Like somewhere it just kicks on. I can't stop it, okay? Uh, and it's very possible if you say something interesting or embarrassing to me, could show up in a sermon, right? So just be aware uh, of that fact. So I was watching this show called Alone completely for my own enjoyment. And then somewhere along the way I thought, oh, that'll preach, right? That'll preach. Um, and it took me immediately to Genesis 2, which we're going to get to in a second. But this idea of the show is a really simple one. It's a survival show, right? There's lots of survival-type shows where you get dropped in the wilderness. The difference in this one is you are completely and totally alone. A lot of times, those survival shows, it looks like the guy is alone, but in reality, there's a camera crew right next to him, okay, filming the whole thing. They're sitting over there, like, eating a Snickers bar while that guy is starving, but at least he's not by himself, Right? But these guys are literally alone. There is no one with them. They were out there for months in the wilderness by themselves. And the, the hunger took a toll. The fear of predators took a toll. But the thing that really took a toll was being alone, the complete and total isolation. And as you watched the show, um, these guys started to go crazy. They really did. They started talking to themselves. They started seeing things that weren't there, hearing things that weren't there. They started... To lose it because isolation is not good for us. Being alone at times can be refreshing and good for spiritual renewal, but total isolation, being totally alone is not good for us. It's not good for our minds, it's not good for our bodies, and it's not good for our souls. And so the idea of this series is really simple. We are made for relationships. We are made for community. And when we don't have those things in our lives, it is difficult to be healthy in any way. 
It is difficult to be physically healthy. It is difficult to be spiritually healthy. It is difficult to be emotionally healthy because isolation is not good for us. It is harmful to us in the long run. In fact, I can prove it, right? I actually at one point was a psychology major and then a double major in psychology and biblical uh, education. And so I studied some of these things and what isolation does to the body. And there have been some specific studies on children who were born into isolated environments, i.e. orphanages. There was one study in particular on uh, orphans in Romania back in the 1980s who were left in their cribs by themselves for hours and hours and hours at a time, right? No one to hold them, no one to comfort them, no one to care for them. And, and the orphanages necessarily aren't at fault. There were just too many kids and not enough people to care for them, right? And so these, or, these babies are left in their cribs for hours at a time, and they studied the differences, the, the physiological differences in these babies compared to other babies. And a couple things that they noted. The stress hormone cortisol, uh, which causes that fight or flight instinct that we have, was greatly elevated in these children. That's something they could measure. The different levels of oxytocin and vasopressin, which are hormones that are linked to emotional and social, social bonding, were much lower in these children. And what they've seen in the long run in these children, their behavioral differences are poor impulse control, social withdrawal, problems with coping, regulating emotions, low self-esteem, pathological behaviors such as tics, tantrums, stealing, and self-punishment, poor intellectual functioning, and low academic achievement. Now we tend to think, well, they'll grow out of it. Like once they're adopted and in a loving home, then, then that will compensate. But it doesn't. Lifelong permanent problems were the result of not being cared for, not being touched enough at birth. Being alone is harmful to us. Physically harmful to us. Emotionally harmful to us. And I would add spiritually harmful to us. And we can measure it. Being alone is not good. Now sometimes in American culture we romanticize functioning independently. In fact, a hero uh, in early television was the Lone Ranger, right? The Lone Ranger is a hero of early television and radio, and, and of course we love this idea that he wanders the desert fighting for justice all by himself. And yet you might forget that he was not all by himself, right? Who did he have with him? Tonto, yeah, his, uh, his little sidekick, a little bit like Robin to Batman. He was not actually alone. He had help. But maybe more importantly, he had companionship. Someone he could count on, someone he trusted, someone he knew would have his back. And isn't that what we all really need? So I want to go to Genesis 2, that verse that popped into my mind as I watched that TV show. If you have your Bibles, feel free to turn to it. Genesis is the first book of the Bible. It's really easy to find. Genesis 2, starting at verse 18. This is right after the whole creation story. God has created Adam in the garden. And then God has this conversation kind of with himself. Okay, this is how it goes. The Lord God said, It is not good for man to be alone. I will make a suitable helper for him. Really, this is the sermon, okay? Uh, I don't have to keep reading. I'm going to keep reading. But this is the sermon. This is that verse that popped into my mind as I was watching this show. It is not good for man to be alone. It is not good for man to be alone, okay? If you've got to camp on a verse, camp on that one. That's the one we're talking about. But God continues. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was his name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and the wild animals. This is, by the way, the first occupation of man is to name things. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. Now, he doesn't say this out loud, but God is kind of implying that for every other creature, there was a suitable helper, right? For, for each you know, male of the species, there was a female of the species. But Adam was alone. Adam did not have one of his kind with him. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. 
And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. So the story that we're reading is about Adam and Eve in a specific place in a specific time. But then the implication here in verse 24 is this applies to all of us. It's not just about Adam and Eve. It's about all of us. All of us need this kind of relationship. All of us need companionship. Marriage is one form of companionship and a good and a holy form of companionship. But all of us need companionship. We need a helper. We need a companion. We need someone that we can join with. That it is not good for man to be alone. I'm going to be talking about this more next week. But what we need is real connections. Not just like small talk, not just chatting about the weather, not just passing someone by in the hallway and either saying hi or if you're a guy giving them the head nod, right? Like we need real relationships, not just people we know, but people we really know and who know us and who we can be honest and real with. Uh, the Christian term that we often use is fellowship, right? I grew up in a, a big church, and we had what we called Fellowship Hall. And Fellowship Hall was my favorite place in the church because that's where the donuts were, right? So as a child, the first thing I did when I got to church was ask my dad for a dollar so I could go buy a donut. Uh, you didn't actually have to buy them. They were free, but you could make an offering, right? So it was kind of expected that you gave something. So I'd ask my dad for money. He would give me money. I would go get a donut. I loved Fellowship Hall. That's also where I saw my friends because they were also getting donuts, right? So I would go in there. I would get my donut. We'd all have the powdered sugar on our face, and we would talk about, hey, how was your weekend? What would you do yesterday? How was your soccer game? Blah, 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 blah. But what I noticed about Fellowship Hall, especially as I got older, is that all the conversations were the same. All the conversations were, hey, did you watch the Colts game yesterday? Or, or you know, who do you think is going to win this game? Or, you know, blah, 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 blah. It, it was all so peripheral. It was all so shallow. It was about such simple things. Oh, yeah, I was painting the house yesterday. Or, oh, I heard you. You guys moved. You know, like simple stuff. Nobody was ever sharing the, the deep things in their life. Nobody was sharing about the, the hurts or the pains that they were going through. Nobody was sharing about the real stuff. Fellowship, in my mind, became synonymous with donuts and shallow conversations. And that's not what it means at all, right? There's a biblical word that we translate fellowship that is so much deeper than what I experienced as a child. The word is koinonia, koinonia. And yes, if you are familiar with the state of Indiana, there is a very small town in Indiana called koinonia. Uh, but biblically, the word koinonia, which is often translated fellowship means so much more than that. It does mean fellowship or an association, a community, communion, or joint participation in something. It is to share in something, to participate in something. It can even be translated as intimacy, physical intimacy. That is how deep the connection of koinonia is. It can be used to uh, talk about money that is given for something that is given for a deep purpose, right? If your brother or sister in Christ is in trouble, then you can share with them, you can participate in their sufferings through a koinonia offering, taken up to care for someone in a time of need. It also depicts an interactive relationship between God and the believers who are sharing life together through Christ, right? It is a word that, that, that revolves around relationship. Uh, and that offering one that I talked about earlier is seen when the church in Macedonia uh, needed help and other believers came in and shared with them. They gave out of koinonia. They gave out of true relationship. And again, we use this word fellowship a little too lightly because real koinonia is much, much deeper. It is what connects us in Christ. Uh, author Jared Wilson said this, In the church, you and I say to each other, you and I are not alike at all. 
We have no reason to be together except Christ. That makes us family. So even though we have nothing else in common, I'm with you, I'm for you. You see, friendships are often built on mutual interest, right? I find out that you like the same thing I like, and now we talk about it. But in the church, it's so interesting. We are all connected, not because we have much in common, not because we're some from the same place or like the same things or, or we're a similar age. We are connected by a bond that is so much deeper than that. We are connected by our mutual relationship in Jesus Christ, and that makes us family. That makes you my brothers. That makes you my sisters. We are bonded together in that way. That's what koinonia means. And that's what we should seek, real community. And yet, Christians, not only now, but through the ages, have sometimes avoided real community. Because real community can be messy and difficult and, frankly, at times, annoying. Okay? So I want to give you an example. It's kind of an extreme example from church history. Uh, I recently took a class on church history. I hadn't taken a class on church history in 20 years. And this is one of the stories that, in a very boring textbook, um, popped off the page for me. And I remembered learning about it before. It is about St. Simeon the Stylite. Okay? And we have a picture of him here. Not a, not a picture picture, right? A drawing of St. Simeon the Stylite. St. Simeon came to Christ at a young age and decided he wanted to be a monk. He lived in the, t in, he was born around 390 AD, felt called to ministry and called to a life of austerity and becoming a monk. And so he entered a monastery, uh, but was kicked out of that monastery because he was too uh, serious about his monastic vows. He would go long periods of time without eating. He would spend days and days in prayer. And the other monks apparently were threatened by his devotion and une unable to equal his zeal. They asked him to leave. Uh, he then wandered around for a while as a hermit, not knowing what to do. Uh, many people at this time started following him, wanting to learn about how to become so zealous for the Lord. This annoyed St. Simeon the Stylite quite a bit, okay? He did not like these people following him. He wanted to get away from the crowds. And so he decided uh, to climb on top of a tall column to escape his pursuers and pray and meditate. He enjoyed this very much. Uh, he stayed on this column for several months and then decided to get down, not because he wanted to interact with people again, but to get on top of a taller column where he would stay for the next 30 years of his life on top of a column that was 60 feet tall and 6 feet wide. And that is where he lived for 30 years. He even at night would chain himself to the column so that he did not accidentally fall off while sleeping. He had a basket that he would raise and lower so people could give him food. Okay, And he enjoyed living on this column quite a bit. His name, St. Simeon the Stylite, comes from the word stylite, meaning of the column. Interestingly and ironically, uh, his long-term choice of dwelling on top of this column greatly multiplied the crowds uh, that gathered near him, which irritated him even more. So St. Simeon, and I'm still not sure why he's a saint, but anyway, St. Simeon lived on top of a column for 30 years to get away from people. My question for St. Simeon, if I could talk to him today, is how are you supposed to do the things that Jesus asked you to do if you avoid the people that Jesus told you to love? How are you supposed to make disciples of all nations if you live on top of a column by yourself? How are you supposed to share the good news of Jesus Christ with others if you don't interact with others? How are you supposed to baptize people if you're 30 feet in the air away from them? How can you do what Jesus told you to do? Jesus said that we would be known by our love, not by the height of the column which we live upon. Right? St. Simeon is an extreme example, I admit, and yet some of us do tend to isolate ourselves. We isolate ourselves because we've been burned before, because we trusted someone and they broke our trust, and now we don't want to put ourselves back in that same situation again. We isolate ourselves for convenience. Frankly, it's easy in this day and age to live an isolated life. You don't have to interact with people if you don't want to interact with people. You can get your groceries delivered to your doorstep. You can um, 
watch movies on your television. You don't need to go to a movie theater anymore. You can do, you can order anything you want from anywhere in the world and it will come to you sometimes by a drone, apparently. Like, we don't ever have to interact with people anymore. And some people don't. They live a completely isolated life. And let's be honest, the pandemic has made it worse. We have become more and more cut off from our neighbors, from our communities, from our world. And how are we, if we allow ourselves to become isolated, supposed to do the things that Jesus told us to do if we don't connect with the people around us? How can we love our neighbor if we don't know our neighbor? We need to be careful, though we don't live on top of a column, to not fall into the same trap that St. Simeon fell into. To avoid life because it's easier. In fact, we're told the opposite. That it's better to be in community. Though it's hard, I admit, though you will get burned from time to time, it's better to live in community. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 is a verse I often read at weddings. It says this, Two are better than one, because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. It's an interesting verse. Um, it's very good for weddings, of course, because the idea of joining together in marriage and helping each other throughout your life. It talks about two, it talks about two, it talks about two, it talks about two. And then all of a sudden it says, and a cord of three strands which is interesting. You're like, wait, where's, th where's three coming from? And of course, I always point out to that bride and that groom that the third strand is God. That, that two strands is, is certainly better than one. It's going to be stronger. But if you add in the strength of a relationship built on God, built on godly principles, your relationship will be stronger than any relationship that is just built on two people. People fail, right? We know this. People have failed you. People have failed me. But a relationship built with God in it is stronger than a relationship without God in it. And so we try to be that cord of three strands. Unfortunately, we tend to apply this just to marriages, right? We read this in a wedding situation and we think, oh, that's nice. Good luck. You're a couple. Good luck. You have God. But we forget that, that Ecclesiastes wasn't actually written to be about weddings. This is advice for life. This is advice for all of us. We are supposed to remember that we are better together than we are alone. We are stronger together than we are alone. When we have church, when we have each other, we are stronger. When we find ourselves in a difficult situation, we have people who will pray for us. When we find ourselves falling into sin, we have people who can hold us accountable. We are better together. In fact, so much of the New Testament is written to a we rather than um, me. In, in our American brain, somehow we miss this. Somehow we make everything about me and I. But it's so often written to a plural. The advice that Paul gives to his churches is almost always written to a plural audience. Not an individual audience, but to a plural audience. Because Paul understood that people were in churches. People were in faith communities. He didn't write very often to individuals, and when he did, he named them. But he wrote to church communities, to this we sense of church. He's giving advice to the church community, not just to the individuals in it. And yet you may find yourself, as I sometimes find myself, immediately mentally putting in I and me rather than us and we. So I want to read a verse to you from the book of Hebrews. And I want to point out how often it uses a plural when it's giving us advice on what it means to live the way God desires us to live. This is from Hebrews chapter 10. It says, Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful and let us consider 
how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. How can we live these words alone? How can we encourage ourselves? How can I hold myself accountable? I cannot. I cannot live out these words without you. And you cannot live them out without me. We need each other to be what God desires us to be. Alone we might survive, but together we might thrive. If you want to be who God wants you to be, you can't be it alone. If you want to be a godly church community, it's going to take all of us doing our part. We were meant to be together, to encourage each other, to love each other, to hold each other accountable, to pray for one another, to make meals for one another when someone is sick, to care for each other. That's what we are supposed to do. And if we do it, we will find that we are healthy. We are find that we are strong. We, are, we will find that we are mentally and emotionally healthy and well. God will bless us if we do what we are told to do. I believe that. I don't think it's easy. I think it's hard. I think sometimes we don't even want to try. We just want to come and sit and sing and then leave. I'm not asking you to do that. I'm asking you to be the church. I'm asking you to live a life of koinonia. If you want the other one, I hope this isn't that kind of church. If you just want to come and sit and sing and leave, I don't want that for this church. I want this to be a church where people know each other, where people care for each other, where if you're going through a hard time, that we would pray for you and help you and love you and encourage you during that. If you're struggling in your faith, that you would be able to have a real conversation about that. Where you can say, you know what? I'm struggling. Would you, would you help me? Would you talk to me? Would you pray for me? That's what I want. That's the church I want to be a part of. That's where I want my family to be a part of. That's what I want you to have. Because when you have it, it's beautiful. It's rare, but it's beautiful. Where we can be honest about our sins and our failures and our shortcomings. Where we can praise together and, and, and glorify God together, where if you're going through a good time, we can actually be excited with you and not be jealous of you, right? We're going to go through the ups and the downs together. We're going to celebrate together. We're going to pray together. We're going to cry together. We're going to do it all together because alone is not working. Alone is not good. So let's do it together. Amen? Amen. Church, I want to pray for you this morning as we close. Um, next week, we're going to talk a little bit more about what it means to do life together. Um, and I'm going to draw a little bit from a guy named Diedrich Bonhoeffer, who was a priest, uh, a pastor in Germany during uh, the Nazi invasion. And before that, had pastored a church and written a book called Life Together, which is one of my favorite Christian books. And he really believed in intentional Christian community and the benefit that that would have on people. And he tried to live that out as best he could. And then later, when the whole world seemed like it was falling apart, the strength that he found from that is what I believe gave him the strength to do what he had to do uh, to fight the oppression of the Nazis. And so we're going to talk about both of those, and we're going to really draw into what it means to live in an intentional Christian community. So can I pray a blessing over you as we take that challenge together? Father God, I thank you for this church. I thank you that you have put us in this place, that you have put us together. We are your people. That makes us brothers and sisters. And so I pray for my brothers and I pray for my sisters. I pray for the bond that we have together, a bond born through you, through your death and sacrifice for us. I pray that you would strengthen that bond so that we would love each other, not just with an emotional, fleeting love, but with a deep and abiding love that we would love each other through the good and the bad, that we would care for one another, that we would help one another. Father, that this would be a place where we find blessing through relationships, where we can trust one another to be real with each other. Lord, help us to do that. Help us not to be alone. 
Many of us have been alone for far too long. Emotionally alone. Even surrounded in a sea of people, we feel alone. Father, help us to no longer be alone, but to be together. To be part of something bigger. To be a part of a family where we are known, where we are loved, where we can be real. Father, that is my prayer, that you would make this church into so much more than a place where we sit and worship and leave, but into a real Christian community where we would find the depth of real fellowship. Lord Jesus, make it so. In your name we pray. Amen.